Right, folks, you'd have seen something similar on the channel before. This is the TFMSX. This is the second revision that uh, Terrible Fire just released. Uh, this is the Retro Sandwich uh, revision. More spaces for the, for the meat, for the meat, for the meat in the Retro Sandwich. Uh, so he's fixed a lot of uh, the issues uh, from the previous one. He added a couple of uh, revisions to the type of um, power connector, the ability to switch ROMs, uh, the, um, the ability to switch between an MSX2 and MSX2 Plus uh, VDP. A lot of the stuff uh, comes uh, pre-soldered, like uh, all of these guys. Uh, what doesn't uh, come pre-soldered, I believe, is uh, the CPLD, the ARM chip, and uh, this RAM here for the CPLD. I believe you'll have to solder these yourself. Other than that, the rest is all through hole um, components. Uh, so Terrible Fire actually pre-soldered this for me um, because I might yet still be confident enough now at this stage to solder this guy, but this is uh, slightly beyond uh, my uh, ability. I don't have uh, access to a microscope, uh, so I didn't want to take chance. And also, I know some people might be able to solder this with a microscope, but my experience with SMD is still limited to my current uh, Amiga 1200 build, uh, build, which is not finished, which is in progress. But uh, I thought we might tackle this um, as I wait for uh, parts to arrive. So I'm going to uh, do uh, something here. I'm going to put sockets for pretty much everything. I think I have uh, all of it except these sockets for the Z80 and the sound chip that I'm uh, waiting to receive. But you can see uh, the board looks um, nice and tidy. Uh, he's um, he's done even the gold uh, gold legs. Let's see what the uh, markings here uh, mention. Yeah, so the bank here, um, can, the ROM here can have up to four banks, as in four different ROM really, and you can uh, select these with um, is that dip switches somewhere? Yeah, here. So you'll put dip switches here, and you'll be able to select. Um, I think this set of uh, dip switches, which run uh, to use. Uh, he's uh, thanked uh, <laughs> a few number of people, and uh, next week. Next week, balls. So let's build this. Uh, I'm gonna start with the socket for the VDP, the uh, the ROMs here. Uh, I, th I think I have all the parts anyway, so I'm gonna. Just slowly saw the stuff and uh, just report it every, every turn. I have also everything available. Yeah, I do have a VDP, MSX2 VDP. Uh, he gave me a few parts, a box of parts. Um, so that's going to be handy. The power supply, do I have it here handy? The power supply is, is uh, it has an on off switch directly on it. Uh, so you'll find a reference for that as well. So that's actually an option because it saves on space having to have a, an on off switch um, to turn the computer on. Um, if you don't, like we do here in Ireland and the UK, uh, switches directly on your socket. So that's, that's a useful thing to have. So let's get started. Yeah, maybe with the uh, VDP sockets and the uh, ROM sockets. And then I'll put, uh, this is the, uh, the RGB. We'll have to put pin headers as well uh, here. Well, everywhere, but here and here, to uh, to program the RM and the uh, the CPLD. So we'll do that here in this video as well. All right, so I got the socket for the uh, VDP and uh, the uh, RAMs uh, in place. As I'm waiting for two sockets for this guy, I, I'm going to put the socket for the ROM here, uh, which is one of those. It's a true hole version, and uh, you'll see there's a little notch here. And you should align that with the, cor the notch here in the corner. Uh, and to solder, it's pretty much like any uh, any true hole. Uh, we got a, a little uh, crystal clock to put uh, right there. Um, we got the dip switches switches here, which are uh, SMD, and then the DB9 connectors, the RGB connector, and the USB connector and a power connector. So we're going to do this uh, now. Before we continue, I'd like to thank PCBWay for sponsoring this video. They offer PCB manufacturing and part assembly, of course, but they also offer a number of other services like CNC machining, metal sheet fabrication, 3D printing, and even injection molding. Pretty much anything you need for all your projects. Go to PCBWay.com, upload your project files, and get an instant quote. And thank you to them for sponsoring this video. All 
right, that's our um, headers uh, needed uh, to program and the uh, jumpers that would be required. Next, gonna, I'm going to put the uh, dip switches here and we'll uh, move into a connector area. We'll need more headers at some point. I see there's some added here. Uh, I suspect it's related to these guys as well. There's uh, markings on the silk screen as well to tell you what the uh, jumpers actually do. Um, so this this and this will allow you to select between the uh, uh, VDP for MSX2 Plus and MS or MSX2. So it's time to burn the EEPROM. I'm using this uh, standard off-the-shelf cheap uh, Chinese TL866, uh, I think. Uh, you'll need an adapter. So the EEPROM uh, itself is a, a 39SF040 and I'm using an adapter here um, for uh, PPLC32 to DIP32. Um, you'll find them again cheap on eBay. Um, Steven was kind to, uh, enough to provide me this and the uh, the prom as well, so I didn't have to buy a pack of twenty. And uh, and uh, the ROM image is can pretty much be anything you want. It can be a single ROM. In this case, I think there's four ROMs fitted that we'll be able to select with uh, jumpers on the board. But uh, I'm just uh, about to press program on this. Um, so I've loaded the ROM, and there you go. Anyway, that's the prom burned. Let's uh, put that in the uh, board and uh, continue our work. All right, so while we're waiting for sockets to arrive, they're taking their sweet time. Uh, I'm programming the ARM, ARM, the ARM chip here, which uh, handles the USB uh, controls. So uh, I'm using this uh, ST-Link uh, dongle. And I have some pin connected it's upside down, but we have the uh, um, SWDIO, the uh, clock, the reset line and ground, uh, and I need to power this guy in. So essentially, uh, the pins are coming out into this uh, these headers here. Ground needs to be connected and power is provided by just the power in. So I have all that plugged in and I am using... Um, not the Cube, uh, SMT32 uh, Cube programmer. I'm using the old version, the Link. I could not get the uh, programmer to work. Uh, so essentially, I'm just going to connect to um, my device here. Uh, it will tell you that it's connected right here. Uh, what device? We're going to load the bin file. And all we need to do now... It took me a while to figure out because the, the Cube... Uh, software just wasn't working for me at all. Uh, so we're going to program and verify. Uh, we don't need to change anything here. We're just going to say, okay, and there you go. It's uh, it's rather quick. Uh, it's verified. So if I disconnect and if I reconnect now, it should pick up. There you go. Wonderful. Uh, next, we need to program that CPLD. That's going to be a uh, that's going to be fun. See, this should have been the simple part. <laughs> and that took me an hour to figure out. So uh, uh, interesting. But at least I know now that the uh, ST-Link, which is the uh, old version, is still available online anyway on their site. So you can get that. All right. So um, this took a while. This took a while. Oh, my God. Um, it took me a good few hours. Well, an entire night and evening. Um, so I needed the last thing step to do was program the CPLD using this Raspberry Pi. Um, Steven has sent me a guide that somebody made on how to do that. My only problem really is I'm still very much a novice with um, stuff like Raspberry Pi or Lin Linux in general. So even stuff like getting the file onto the uh, the uh, Raspberry was a bit of a problem. Uh, so I didn't know how to do that. I didn't actually know that Raspbian was the old name for, or of Raspberry OS and that kind of stuff. So uh, I put in Raspberry um, 
uh, OS Lite in there and then SSH from my computer over there to uh, to the Pi. Uh, and I was just getting loads of errors and, you know, uh, issues. Uh, Stephen told me that HDMI can actually cause a lot of problem. Initially, I was trying to do this from the command line. So remove the SC, um, HDMI, uh, remove any USB stuff from there. And then um, I had a few more issues, but it seems to have gone okay. So there you go. So that's the uh, MSX now uh, running. Okay, fast forward to a few weeks later. Um, I uh, I encountered some issues with programming the FPGA uh, through the the Raspberry Pi. Essentially, I just could not get the um, the verification uh, steps to happen. What ended up happening is the board was working, but it was sort of slowing down and failing after after five eight minutes. So the, the graphics would start to glitch, then I'd lose the sync, and the screen would go black. I could still hear the music, but it would slow down to a crawl, and then the whole system would die, and it would take a while before I could actually restart it. Um, it like the chip needed to cool down or something. It's, it was just a weird behavior, and neither uh, Stephen or I could actually um, find out why that was happening. It's not happening on any of the other revisions that he has or that you know he's made. Just his board. So uh, I wasn't sure what was going on. Replaced the, uh, the 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 Z80. Replaced the VDP. Swapped the RAMs around. Changed the power supply just in case nothing um, helped. The problem was is I couldn't program it properly. The the programming, you know, the verification failed. It looked like it had somewhat programmed it because it was starting, but no luck. So what I ended up getting is one of those uh, cables instead. So USB cable with some terminals. Uh, and essentially you just plug that in and, uh, and run it through a command line in DOS instead of a, a Raspberry Pi. Um, because the Raspberry Pi itself had some issues, like you can't use it with an HDMI cable plugged in because that interferes. It, it, just, it was just too messy, um, and this worked right out of the box. But yeah, I mean, it's working. It's absolutely working. Uh, the SCC now, uh, it was working fine. There is also, I'm not sure if I mentioned this previously, but uh, this ROM here essentially has four ROMs that you can select with... Um, with these dip switches so you can uh, i have it set up as an msx2 plus should be running at 60 hertz now and uh and yeah delighted with this uh little unit um i think eric i think the revision of the uh, usb i'm using doesn't actually support yet a usb controller but eric has a revision he said that does so um that's working i haven't tested it because i don't have a need to test it but the keyboard is working fine i'm actually using uh, as in the previous version the um this little usb uh, dongle um wireless dongle so that works as well and as you can see i've socketed everything uh, i'll make it handy in the long run um, if something fails to uh, to change parts a cool thing added to switch it off is this little uh uh, power socket type of yoke. Um, uh, Stephen played with the idea of putting a button on it um, to either reset or switch it off, but this is actually a much more elegant uh, solution, I think. I think. And it just... Um, yeah, it because it's trying to save space and parts, you know, the quantities and that kind of stuff. So adding an extra button, however... Uh, low the price they can be it just it's an extra part an extra cost there's no parallel part or things like that because i you know if you're the type that is going to mess around with the parallel part for a printer or for a tape port you probably want to do it from an original a piece of hardware you know if you if you if you have a fetish for printers you're probably <laughs> you're probably deep into uh, the original hardware anyway so adding that kind of stuff to a repro or a clone wouldn't quite make sense this is really for people who want to uh, you know experience the games experience the software but you know if you really want to tinker with hardware you'd probably go down the original hardware route so that's why stuff like that isn't uh, in the scope of the project um uh, and I, I i wanted to mention that because it's been asked in the previous video of the previous revision now the other thing that's cool here is the holes here for 
um, for mounting the PCB. So you could actually put that either on legs or put that in a custom made case. Uh, I believe somebody's been making a sort of a case of sorts already for the uh, TF MSX. Maybe I can link that if I've, uh, if I, if it's available yet. Um, that's something you can 3D print, but um, I'd love to see people actually make their own uh, 3D printed case for, for this. And the other thing, there's a, an attachment that is yet to come, and I'm teasing it this here now because I know Stephen has finished it. I won't say what it is yet, so I'll do another video on, on, on this revision and this attachment. Cool thing Stephen has done here is um, right now I'm using a, an MSX2 Plus VDP, the 9958. If you're using an MSX2 um, VDP, which is the uh, 9939, there's a little silk screen here that tells you to um, what to do with jumper tree, which is this guy here and jumper 4, which is this guy here. So uh, in case of the uh, MSX2+, the uh, 9958, you leave this guy open and you put this one to the left. And for the MSX2 VDP, uh, you put this one to the, sorry, to the right, you put the um, this jumper to the left and you actually populate this jumper here. Um, the reason, I mean, some people have asked, you know, why would you use a MSX2 VDP instead of an MSX2 Plus is because of, of availability and price. Um, these aren't, you know, you know, they're getting harder to find and they're getting more expensive because they're hard to find. So uh, there's plenty MSX2 VDP, which should be plenty already. Um, you know, there's not that many games that really exploit the uh, MSX2+. Plus. Um, it's nice to have, but it's certainly not a strict requirement um, to experience these games. Certainly isn't for games like Vampire Killer or, or uh, Ushas or F1 Spirits. That's MSX1 anyway. But um, even, even stuff that actually takes advantage of the scrolling register for the MSX2 Plus will work just fine on the MSX2. You know, you're just trading off maybe a smoother scrolling, but that's really about it. So an MSX2 uh, VDP will will work just perfectly fine uh, in this instance. There's a reason it's called the Retro Sandwich, and that'll be for a next a next video. But there you go, folks. Uh, this is the a quick build of revision two of the TF MSX. Now the next question obviously is where and when is it available? I am not sure I can answer that yet. Um, as soon as I know Steven's plans, I know his plans is to have um, some of the guys building his uh, terrible fire uh, accelerator cards for the Amiga um, build those as well and some additional people. Um, I'm not sure exactly who's going to tackle that yet as soon as i know i'll update the uh, the description when links you know where you can contact these people um so if it's not in the description is because i don't know yet so <laughs> don't ask me in the comments so anyway that's revision two of the tf msx we're not entirely done with this project there's another little part or board in addition coming that will uh, make this thing even cooler but there you go thank you for watching folks i hope this was interesting and uh, stay tuned for more msx stuff